Nemesis of the Unfinished. The authentic talent of Francis Laporte, fiction writer, was allied with an industry no less than prodigious. Unfortunately, he was self-critical to an excessive degree. Dissatisfaction, morbid and meticulous, kept him from finishing more than one manuscript out of a dozen. Though editors importuned him for stories and bought readily the few that he submitted, Francis could seldom outdistance the wolf by a full running jump. He had left hundreds of stories in various stages of incompletion, clipped together with the double or triple carbons that he was always careful to make. Many ran to the size of novelettes or novels. Some existed only as a few beginning paragraphs. Often he had written several variant versions, carried to more or less length. There were also countless synopses of tales attempted or unbegun. They crammed the drawers of his desk to overflowing. They bulged and towered in insecure piles from the boxes that were stacked along the walls of his study. These voluminous abortions were the labor of a lifetime. Most of them were eldritch tales of horror and death, of wizardry and diabolism. Their pages teemed with spectres and cadavers, with ghouls and loup-garou and poltergeists. Often they haunted Laporte like a bad conscience. Sometimes they seemed to talk to him and reproach him with ghostly whispers in the dark hours before dawn. He would fall asleep vowing to complete one or more of them without further procrastination. In spite of such resolutions, the dust still thickened on the piled reams. A new day would always bring Francis an idea for a new plot. Occasionally he would complete one of his shorter and simpler tales and would receive in due time a small check from outlandish stories or eerie narratives. Then he would indulge in one of his rare debauches of food and wine, and his brain would fume with wild inspirations that he was seldom able to recall afterwards. Though he did not suspect, Laporte was in the position of a necromancer, who has called up spirits from the deep without knowing how to control or dismiss them. He had fallen asleep one night after absorbing nearly a half-gallon of cheap claret, bought from the proceeds of a recent sale. His slumber was heavy but brief. It seemed that a vague commotion in which he distinguished articulate voices had awakened him. Puzzled and still confused by his potations, he listened intently for some moments, but the noises had ceased. Then suddenly there was a sound like the light rustling of paper then a louder noise, as if great masses of paper were sliding and shifting, then conversation, as if a crowd of people were talking all at once. It was an unintelligible babble, and he could determine nothing except that the noises came from the direction of his workroom. Laporte's spine began to tingle as he sat up in bed. The sounds were eerie and mysterious as anything that he had ever imagined in his tales of nocturnal terror. It seemed now that he was overhearing some bizarre and sinister dialogue, in which voices of unhuman timbre replied to others that were apparently human. Once or twice he caught his own name uttered in strange, gibbering tones, somehow fraught with the sense of inimical conspiracy. Laporte sprang out of bed. Lighting an oil lamp and going into his study, he peered into every corner but saw only the stacks of overpiled manuscripts. Apparently the piles were undisturbed, but he seemed to see them through a thick haze. At the same time he began to choke and cough. Going closer to inspect the manuscripts, he perceived that the accumulated dust of months and years had been shaken from their massed reams. He searched the room repeatedly, but found no further sign of invasion, either human or supernatural. Perhaps some sudden gust had performed the mysterious office of dusting the paper piles, but the windows were all closed, and the night outside was windless. He returned to bed, but sleep refused to visit him again. There was no repetition of the rustlings and voices that had seemed to awaken him. He began to wonder if he had been the victim of some distempered dream inspired by the evening's wine. Finally, he convinced himself that this was the only credible explanation. 
The next morning, moved by an unwonted impulse, Laporte selected a manuscript at random from the heaps of unfinished material. It was entitled Incomplete Sorceries, and dealt with a man who had achieved partial power over demons and elementals, but was still seeking certain lost formulae that were requisite to full masterdom. Laporte had abandoned the tale through indecision regarding the alternate solutions of the sorcerer's problem suggested by his all-too-fertile fancy. He sat down at the typewriter, determined that he would finish the story to his satisfaction. For once, he did not hesitate over variant wordings or divergencies of plot development. It all seemed miraculously clear to him, and he wrote steadily through the forenoon and afternoon and evening. At midnight, he ended the last paragraph, in which, after many perils and tribulations, the sorcerer stood triumphant amid his infrangible circles, compelling the dread kings of the four infernal quarters to serve his least whim. Laporte felt that he had seldom written so well. The story should bring him a substantial check, as well as the acclaim of his many faithful but impatient admirers. He would send it out in the morning mail after a few possible retouchings. A new title was manifestly required by the denouement. He would think of one easily after a night's sleep. He had almost forgotten the queer dream that had followed his recent bacchanal. Again he slept deeply, but not too soundly. At intervals, some portion of his brain, emerging numbly from oblivion, seemed to hear the recurrent clatter of his old Remington in the next room. Drugged with fatigue, he did not awaken fully to the strangeness of the sound under such circumstances, but accepted it without question as one accepts the unexplained vagaries of dreamland. After his meager breakfast, Laporte began to reread incomplete sorceries, with his pencil poised for errors of typing or minor revisions. He found nothing to change in the first few pages, written months before, and hastened over their familiar incidents to the point at which he had begun his continuation of the sorcerer's vicissitudes. Here he paused in astonishment, for he could not remember writing a single sentence of the freshly typed paragraphs. The astonishment became stupefaction as he went on. The plot, the incidents, the whole trend of development were alien to what he had conceived and set down. It was as if some demon-guided hand had reversed and perverted the story. Pandemonium and the laws of Pandemonium prevailed throughout. The sorcerer, with all his formulae, was a mere pawn moved hither and thither at their will, in a monstrous game for supremacy over souls and planets and galaxies. The very style was foreign to Laporte's usual manner. It was studded with strange archaisms and neologisms. It burned with phrases like hellish gems. It blazed and vapoured with images that were like censers of evil before satanic altars. More than once, Laporte wanted to drop the horribly transfigured tale but a baleful fascination, mingling with his dumbfoundment and incredulity, held him to the end where the hapless necromancer was crushed into pulp beneath the ponderous grimoires he had collected in his lifelong search for mastery. It was only then that Laporte could lay down the manuscript. His fingers trembled as if they had touched the coils of some deadly serpent. Tormenting his brain for some tenable explanation, he recalled the dreamlike clattering of the Remington that he had seemed to hear in slumber. Was it possible that he had risen from his bed and had rewritten the story in a somnambulistic state? Was it the work of some spectral or demoniac hand? Unmistakably the typing had been done on his own machine. Several slightly blurred letters and punctuation marks occurred throughout the entire manuscript. The mystery disturbed him beyond measure. He had never found in himself the least tendency to sleepwalking or to trance states of any kind. Though the supernatural was, so to speak, his literary stock in trade, his reason refused to accept the ideas of an extra-human agency. Unable to resolve the problem, Laporte tried to busy himself with the beginning of a new tale. 
but concentration was impossible, since he could not dismiss the unanswered riddle from his thoughts for a moment. Abandoning all further effort to work, he left the house with hurried steps, as if driven by the spurs of an incubus. It was many hours later that Laporte wandered homeward, rather unsteadily by the rays of a cloud-strangled moon. Forgetting his usual economy, he had consumed numberless brandies at a village bar. He did not care for the people who frequented such places, but somehow he had been reluctant to leave. Never before had he been loath to face the solitude of his cabin, peopled only with books and manuscripts, with unwritten and half-written fantasies. Still dimly troubled by the mystery that had driven him forth, he fell across the unmade bed without undressing or even lighting a lamp, and slid into drunken slumber. Wild dreams came to visit him anon. Weird voices shrieked and muttered in his ears. Indistinct but nightmarish figures milled around him like the dancers of some demonian sabbat. Amid the voices that seemed to conspire against his peace and safety, he heard the incessant click and rattle of a typewriter. There was a clacking as of drawers opened and shut without cessation, a multitudinous rustling as of paper slithering from place to place in unaccountable sibilant movement. Laporte awoke from endless repetitions of this dream to find that the noises still continued. Again, as on a former occasion, he sprang from bed, lit his lamp, and entered the workroom from which the sounds and voices appeared to come. Still dazed with sleep and inebriation, his eyes beheld a vast chamber whose roof and walls receded beyond the illumination of the lamp he carried in shaking fingers. Amid this chamber his manuscripts rose in massive piles, multiplied and magnified as if by the black sorcery of hashish. They seemed to loom above him with topless tears, lost in the reaches of some Avernian vault. On the desk at the room's centre his Remington, operated as if by some unseen entity, ran and clattered with infernal speed. Black lines appeared momently on the sheet that emerged rapidly from the roller. The floor was covered with other sheets, lying singly or in heaps, that slid and rustled about the chamber in mysterious perpetual agitation. The air was filled with the eerie gibberings and whispers that had haunted Laporte's dreams and awakened him. They came, it seemed, from nowhere and everywhere, from the scattered pages on the floor from the typewriter desk, from the tiered boxes and reams that beetled into nightmare vastness, and from the apparent vacancy of space itself. Laporte felt on his face the breathing of terrible powers, of eldritch and forbidden things, as he stood in hesitant stupor on the threshold. A wind sprang up, he knew not whence, winding and wreathing about him in icy serpentine volumes. He thought that the room grew vaster, that the floor heaved and tilted at strange, impossible angles, that the towers and battlements of swollen manuscripts leaned toward him in perilous inclination. The weird wind strengthened and swiftened, sweeping up the numberless loose sheets in a wild storm, and extinguishing the lamp that he held in his nerveless hand. Darkness fell a darkness of vertigo and delirium, into which Laporte was hurled resistlessly, falling through endless gulfs, battling with countless evil things that swooped upon him from all directions, and hearing a thunder as of loosened avalanches. Neighbours, noticing the absence of smoke from Laporte's chimney, and missing him on the road to the village, became sufficiently alarmed to investigate after the third day. Opening the unlocked outer door, they saw the littered paper mingled with fragments of a shattered kerosene lamp that overflowed the threshold of his workroom. Ream upon ream of paper almost filled the room itself, a mountain of heaped and dishevelled manuscripts covering the one chair and desk and typewriter with its high-piled summit. They found Francis Laporte lying in a convulsed posture beneath the pile. 
In his rigid hands, upthrust protectively before his face, were clutched the sheets of several thick manuscripts, torn and ripped asunder as if in some violent struggle. Other sheets, torn to confetti-like pieces, strewed his upturned body. Still others were locked in a titanic rigor between his bared teeth.